the Saturday sermon. Um, this video is just for my family members and my close friends. Um, this video is just for my family members and my close friends. I'm not telling you, you don't, you don't, I don't want you to watch it, you watch it with your mama. This video is specifically made for my close friends and family members. I'm gonna um I'm gonna start with two stories. One story one side of my family already and the other story, neither side or my friends have ever heard. And I'll start with that one. No, I'll start with the family story. My father was born and raised in Middleton, Tennessee, the same town that um, Fred Smith, I think that's his name, creator, the owner of Federal Express, that's where he's from. My dad was born second oldest of 15 kids, I think it was. And um, they were all on a farm. To start on a farm, my grandfather rented land at first. And then um, he bought some land, 250 acres approximately. And he started a farm. Now, I don't know how prosperous the farm was. I just know that they didn't have to go shopping for most of the stuff they ate. He sold occasional livestock, but for the most part, it was a working farm that wasn't set up as a business, if you will. It did business, but it wasn't set up as a business. I don't know how many and when, but I would say the majority of the kids in that family basically got run away from home. They didn't run away from home, they got run off. Because they didn't want to work the farm anymore. All the boys did, basically, they got run off. There was one thing that my grandfather did not possess. And that was the knowledge of wealth generational wealth. Either he didn't know it or didn't want to know it. I don't know and I'm not trying to speculate. Now, trust me, I was in love with my grandfather. He was the greatest, he was the greatest. But, there's a lot of things he didn't even know he didn't know. So, when he died, he had no will, no documents saying what he wanted to have happen. And when he died, my grandmother basically had to get moved away from that land 
and eventually it went into probate. And to this day, there may be a couple of cousins, maybe a sister or brother every now and then, a few, maybe small number, who own some of it, but 99% of that 250-acre farm, not one person last name Sane owns one blade of grass. Now, if he had just known, and if the kids could have just seen what that could have been, think about it. When he bought that land, it probably cost him 30 grand. 250 acres probably cost him less than $30,000 over time. I'm sure he paid off in time, but it didn't cost him 30 grand over time when he bought it in the 30s, the 1930s. Yeah, 250 acres is probably five or six, eight thousand dollars. And he worked that farm, and when he died, nobody owned it. And one of the sons who's passed on, he put together a package to buy it, he and his wife. And then he lost it. And now nobody has it. And at one point, there was a farm in. Uh, Middleton area was called Sane Farm. It was for sale. $2.3 million for 987 acres of land. Huge. A little lake on it. Big lodge like cabin. I had a lot of ideas about it, but I didn't have the money to do anything with it. And I didn't dare bring it to the family to say, hey, let's get together and buy this farm. <laughs> right? So, But again, if you don't know what you don't know, it is what it is. But that was a moment in time that was lost. Never to come back again. You could try to recreate it, but for the most part, it was a moment in time that was lost. Now let me tell you the story about my mom's side of the town. One of her sisters, Lulu, and she rest in peace. She was an educator. She was a teacher her whole life. Allen White High School. And she was just a teacher, you know, a little bit of money. And but she she knew some things. So after she died. One of our cousins was set up as the executor for her estate. And every one of her living siblings, all of her nieces and nephews, all got a check from some stuff she put together when she was alive because she knew a couple of things. When she did that, that set my mind and, you know, set my mind going. She broke the curse. It was a small, meager thing, but she broke the curse. And then shortly after that, I get a check for about 300 bucks. My dad had a life insurance policy he took out and made all of us the beneficiary. Even then, he knew a little bit of something. And he used it, and he broke the curse. Now here's a story that neither one of my family, besides my family, know. One of my business partners called me a couple of two or three days ago. I don't know when you're watching this, but today, three or four days ago, she called me, and she wanted to get involved. And the ownership stake in our renewable energy company. And I talked to her for about five minutes, and then she got off the phone, did what she needed to do, got her stuff in order, and now she is a minority owner of the company. She's a dividend recipient. She will be receiving checks every month 
like clock. Just like if she had bought 50 shares of 3M or any other number of uh, dividend producing stocks. But the difference is with those companies, you're buying shares of stock and you're just seeking a dividend. You're not a, a literal owner. You own start shares of stock, so you have a stake in the company. But our company has not gone public. But we have a shareholder ownership agreement where there will only ever be, never be more than 10,000 owners of the company. Directors, if you will. There will never be more than 10,000. And when it hits 10,000, and let's say 3,000 for whatever reason decide they drop out for whatever reason, they're not going to replace it with 3,000 more people. It will be 7,000 people going forward. And those owners slash dividend holders will share in 5% of the net profit of the entire company, which is an international renewable energy company. Now, why am I telling you guys this? Well, because if you know me and you've been around me and you watch me from afar, which most of you do, you've seen I'm a businessman and I'm a successful businessman. I'm not as successful as I want to be, but I'm a successful businessman. And one of the things that makes me more successful than money is the knowledge of what I didn't know, but now I do. So, with that said, if you are in my immediate family, if you're in my concentric circle of family, If you are one of my closest friends, if you are in a second tier friendship, I'm going to make this statement one time and you'll never have to worry about me talking to you. This company is positioned to basically be the sales arm of the U.S. government for not only EV charging stations, but for the whole complete EV and solar, wind, biothermal, geothermal, and hydrogen technologies. This company is poised to be a multi-billion dollar company in 24 to 36, no, in 12 to 24 months. Because again, I said it's international. International, not just one country, but Boom. Global. It's a global renewable energy company. So, what I want you to do is think for a second. If your last name is associated or your genetics is associated the same, imagine. If N.T. say, my grandfather, may he rest in peace. 
Imagine if he had come to all of his children and said, look, I'm not going to live forever. But if you just work with me and not against me, This can all be yours. Then every one of those children, right now, if they held on to it, made sure that nobody owned it and it didn't have the last name saying, those children right now would be sitting on a gold mine. Missed opportunity. Now let me tell you the story that neither one of you guys know. My business partner again, who got started, she told me a story as to why she got started and she was so eager about it. She said when her father was alive, he worked like a Hebrew slave. And as he got older, he developed lung cancer. But before he got lung cancer, he was working somewhere. And a guy comes up to him and says, I think his name is John. He said, John, I might be wrong, John, so don't be upset. He said, John, I need you to give me $10. Give me $10 and change my life. And John didn't do it. But John figured, I, I, I can't give you $10? Tell me what you're talking about. Because I can't really tell you about it right now, John. Now, people rip you off all the time, so I'm not saying that's what you should do. If you do your due diligence, of course. But John didn't do it. Fast forward about a year or two later, and that same guy comes around, and John's standing outside on a break, having a sandwich and drinking. The guy walks up to John and says, John, you see that what you're drinking right now? If you'd have gave me that ten dollars, you'd own a piece of that right now. You'd be a multimillionaire, you wouldn't be sitting here. So she said, that was my dad's coke moment. And my dad told me, she said, my dad told me on his deathbed, if you ever find yourself in a coke moment situation, take it. No matter what it takes to do it. Take it and make it happen. Descendants of the Sane and Green family and all of my close personal friends, this is your Coke moment. And I hope you take me seriously. And if you don't, that's cool. But I'm just saying, I hope you take me seriously. Because once 10,000 is hit, it's all over. You can, get, you can be a part of a company and build a business if you want, but if you want to be in the front of a wave, a $400 billion wave that the United States government has already committed to, a worldwide wave that all the nations of the earth have committed to, like it, or not, believe in it or not, have political leanings that force you to be against it or not. This is happening. Every major car manufacturer on earth is gearing itself up to only make electric and hydrogen powered cars and trucks, SUVs, whatever. This is happening. This is not only your Coke moment. This is your Coke moment, your Apple moment, your Microsoft moment, your Bitcoin moment, your Tesla moment. This is your moment.
I get paid when people charge their EVs, cars, trucks, motorhomes. I get paid on kilowatt hours. And that's just one way. This is your Amazon moment. You know that moment when Jeff Bezos back in 1994 said, I'm gonna build a store online and sell books? And he came to you and said, hey, give me a hundred bucks a month. And for that hundred bucks a month, I'm not selling you stock because I'm not selling you stock at all. Because I haven't become I haven't gone public yet. But I'm gonna sell you, I'm gonna sell you. A Amazon bookstore. I'm going to advertise it for you. I'm going to even advertise on television for you. A thousand television ads a month on television, Roku, CBS, Fox, Netflix, Amazon television, YouTube TV. I'm going to gas station TVs. I'm going to advertise your Amazon store at whatever zip code you choose. I'm going to do that for you. And as a thank you for supporting the uplifting of my business, I'm going to give you shares of stock in the company and make your own in 1994. If he had come to you, you'd have said no, wouldn't you? And me, I would have been trying to figure it out. That's what being in business all this time for myself has taught me. It has taught me when opportunity knocks. This is that opportunity. I'm not telling you not to do your due diligence. 100 bucks a month, a lot of money, a lot of people. But just imagine if you had owned shares of stock and was an owner of Amazon in 1994 and he was paying you a dividend check every quarter. You would be making a million bucks a month right now. Minimum. And guess what? Amazon is not a seven trillion dollar industry. Click on the link. Or call me. If you know me, you know that number. Let's figure it out together. I'm creating generational wealth. How about you? Like that? I'll finish my cigar. I want to kiss my kid. I have to brush my teeth. And always in parting.